Welcome back to another Wednesday night at Promised Land. We're so glad you're with us. I want to encourage you to share out this feed. Um, remember, that's kind of how we spread the word these days about church. It's sort of like inviting everybody you know to church. So uh, particularly, I, I'm pushing down a little more than usual on these Wednesday nights right now. Uh, where we're talking about the promised land identity and vision, mission, values, statements, talking about what it means to be a member of promised land. And of course, we know that the, the, the Lord told the prophet Habakkuk, you have to write the vision in big, bold letters and make it very clear so that whoever's running by can, can read it and know what to run on for. And so... Uh, I would encourage those of us uh, who who are watching this live to share these out and and just uh, let you know your network know that this is how our church is is talking about itself and how we're seeing how we fit into uh, God's plan and purpose for this moment and. And for that reason, it's really exciting. It's like it's the first time we've been able to catch our breath uh, since we arrived in Austin at the beginning of March 2020, and the whole world changed. And then it feels like uh, between all of that stuff, this is the first moment, pandemics, winter storms, everything, suddenly we've got this pocket where we can talk about a little bit about who we believe we are as a church family, who, what our identity is in Christ and in this generation, what is our call and our mission and, and um, where we believe we're supposed to go with that. And so as I said last week, so much of this is really not inventing something new at all or, or even saying what we aspire to it's just putting into words what we are because there is a, a biblically grounded New Testament local church at 51st Street and has been for decades and it, it functions powerfully and uniquely in the kingdom. And so part, a significant part of what we're doing here is just finding ways to define what that is and how it functions and, and how God uses this local assembly, put it into words. And then part of it is verbalizing, encapsulating, putting on a bumper sticker where we're going, where we believe God is taking us in this next run uh, for, for our church. And so we're very excited to be doing it. It's needed to happen for quite a while and and I'm so thankful that we're here. And when this feed goes down in a few minutes, I definitely want you to uh, be watching uh, for the Zoom and Facebook group info so you can jump into a class and, and uh, so much of uh, how we are currently addressing, you know, ministry specific needs, needs specific to men, women, youth, needs specific to those who feel called to a higher level of operation in spiritual warfare and prayer with the Nazarite prayer class. And that a lot of how we're addressing those needs in the church right now are tied to these virtual classes. And we look forward to a time, God willing, maybe even very soon, where we can have a face-to-face -face component in a lot of that again. Um, but for the time being, it's just so crucial for the life of our church. So grab a class that looks like it's made for you and jump in it at the end of this feed, which will be in just a few minutes. So I want to pick up where we left off last week. And uh, we were discussing the Promised Land Identity Statement. And it just the short version again, we are a spirit-filled and spirit-led church with a high view of scripture. A faith family, and then the, the longer version, a faith family of believers united by covenant in Christ 
governed by the Holy Bible, and motivated by love. I believe each of these components is very crucial to describing our identity because I believe that any one component on its own, number one, can be a myth. The the work of God doesn't exist in a vacuum. So if you go very far claiming to be spirit-filled, but you don't show the evidence of being spirit-led, more and more I would tend to question whether you are remaining full of the Spirit, certainly whether you're stirring up that gift in you, even you as an individual believer. You may receive the baptism of the Spirit when you trust in Christ, when you repent of your sins, when you're water baptized, somewhere in there you even have this this powerful, overwhelming, ecstatic experience that we want for everybody of experientially receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not just We're not just talking about a theological concept. For those of us in the spirit-filled movement, we can point to a place and time when the spirit of God just overwhelmed us and took us over and it was palpable. We knew it was happening. We could feel it happening. It changed everything. And so as as an individual believer, you may be able to point to that time But if you can't point to how you have been led by that spirit into greater truth, greater uh, kindness and compassion and patience and and into the the rock solid positive knowledge of, of God's will in your life and that kind of thing, if you can't point to that after a while, it begins to call into question whether you are living in a place of being radically filled with the Spirit, because God's work doesn't exist in a vacuum. So if you are full of the Holy Ghost and you're stirring that up, then I believe you're going to see the evidence of that in the fruit of the Spirit in your life, in the gifts of the Spirit in your life, in the the fact of being led by the Spirit and, and not belonging to yourself, not leading yourself, but being led by the gift of God in you. Um, So to say spirit-filled and spirit-led is two ways of describing the same thing, but it also reminds us that both components are very necessary uh, to the the New Testament identity of a healthy local church. And then the the statement with a high view of scripture, that's in there for a a very similar reason that the spirit-led phrase, follow spirit filled. And I want to read you right now from Acts chapter two, verse four. Again, I'm reading out of the New King James Version tonight. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there's been a great tendency in the spirit filled movement in the Pentecostal charismatic stream of American Christianity, certainly to be very focused on this, this moment in time when somebody is baptized in the spirit, um, will speak with unknown tongues. Sometimes I have seen it where it's very clear cut. It's, it's another tongue that the person doesn't have the possibility of knowing themselves, say an English speaker speaking Mandarin Chinese, which has happened. Um, and it's maybe there's somebody that happens to be nearby that hears that. And again, these reports are not at all unheard of, even in our modern day, where perhaps an unbeliever is overhearing this happening and begins to look into it. Do you understand what you said? Do you know the language you were speaking? I heard you praising God in this language that I know. And it builds great faith in unbelievers when that sign happens, which I believe is why the Bible tells us that tongues were given to us because of unbelievers. Just like it did on the day of Pentecost when the gift of tongues operates that way with another human language that we can't know pouring out of our mouth the praises of God, that builds great faith in honest hearts around us of people who who are still seeking. And... Um, so that's a wonderful way it operates. There's also this 
other side of it that's more personal and and perhaps more common, I would say, in our day at least, which is just the the what Paul called the groanings and unutterable phrases, the Spirit speaking through us in a language that only we and God understand between us, or perhaps, and we only understand it in terms of the work that it's doing in us, we don't usually have an understanding of what we're actually saying. And uh, then there's also the possibility that you're speaking in an angelic tongue because there are angelic languages, languages from heaven, really, languages that are used in other realms. And we could be speaking to God or speaking to the Lord's messengers in those languages. And um, I believe it's very clear to me that scripture makes allowance for these different types of tongues. And that's not the only types there are. There's also the public gift of, of tongues and interpretation. And so there's been a lot of focus on that rightly. There should be. My concern is that we would also focus very much on the other evidences of the Spirit that are supposed to be in our lives when uh, this happens. Number one, it, it's power for something. Jesus told the disciples to stay in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high and you will become witnesses. So they were going to receive power to become witnesses or martyrs of the gospel. You, you're going to need a strong connection to your faith to be ready to die for it and do so with dignity. And so they had to stay in Jerusalem to receive power to become martyrs. The, the, the Holy Ghost brings with it the, the power to do things that are beyond our ability. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 says it this way, uh, the, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The people who know their God so this, this strong, personal, Holy Ghost-powered connection between you and your God will give you the strength to carry out great exploits in his name. Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 16, just before he would pray for himself and for the disciples and for all the believers to come, and, and he was preparing for the final leg of the journey up a lonely hill with a cross on his back. And he told the disciples, as, as things are winding down in John 16, 12, and 13, he says, I still have many things to say to you. Well, in the three years of his ministry, Jesus did not have time to say everything that needed to be said. It took so long to even get his little group disciple just to the point that they could understand anything that he said. And so as he prepared to walk the hill, he, he, he told them, I, I have a lot of things I haven't gotten a chance to tell you. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He said, you're not even ready for them yet. As much as I've spent time preparing you and you've been through so much with me, you're not ready for the rest of what I have to say. So just think about the impact of those words. When Jesus left this earth, there were a lot of things that we needed to know that he didn't have time to tell us because we weren't ready to hear them. So then what's the solution to that? We, there's a lot we don't know that we need to know and Jesus gives it. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Uh, other translations say he will lead you and guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come, which is the same prerequisite that Jesus gave for why we should believe him. He said, I, I don't speak anything but that which my father gives me to say. So the reason we can believe the Holy Ghost is because it doesn't speak anything that our father is not telling us, our father in heaven. So the, the Holy Ghost, the gift, the comforter, it is with us so that we can be led by it and guided into the fullness of the truth and knowledge that Jesus has prepared for us. None of this knowledge, now hear me, this is, this is where it gets very crucial. 
None of this knowledge that we will be led to will ever conflict with or even be greater than the record of scripture that we have contained in our Bible. So God will never tell you anything that conflicts with scripture. He will never tell you anything that is more important than what we have in scripture. Everything that we need to know that the spirit will teach us, the spirit teaches us by making the written word of God come alive to us, become quick, alive. That's what the the King James Version says, quick and powerful, alive and powerful like a two-edged sword. So it's the Holy Ghost within us that makes the Holy Bible not just a dusty book on a shelf, but makes it the living, breathing word of God that comes into our lives and brings us revelation. The record of God's word to humanity is contained in scripture, but... It requires the Holy Ghost to make us alive to that knowledge. And there was so much the disciples did not yet understand that was to be revealed to them out of the Torah, out of the first testament of the Bible, so that they could be inspired to write the New Testament. And that's what happened. They were inspired and they wrote the New Testament. And when the canon closed and those original disciples that Jesus said, there's a lot more I need to tell you, but I'm gonna have to let the Spirit do it as you are able to bear it. Once those apostles died, there's no more that God will tell us that is not simply contained in scripture, but has not been available to us yet. And that's what happened in in the Torah, in the first testament of scripture, the disciples had the whole thing in front of them, but they hadn't had their understanding made alive by the Holy Ghost yet to the extent that they could write out what we needed to know from the first testament into the New Testament. So really what the New Testament is, is the Holy Ghost giving a commentary on the Torah. Really, that's what it is. The the New Testament is a perfectly inspired Bible commentary on the First Testament. It tells us what we've been told. It tells us, you know, the old statement, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Well, when God spoke to his prophets of old and they had to speak to Israel, he said, I'm going to tell you this. God's telling you this. Then the scribe wrote it down and told us what they just said they would tell us. And then the Holy Ghost came behind that, moved on these 12, uh, really 13 disciples um, and, and through their work and the compilation of their work, several writers emerged from among those original disciples and the little group around Jesus like Luke, just a very few people that had the anointing on them to encapsulate all of that truth in the New Testament about the Old Testament. So now that we've got both Testaments, the Holy Spirit will make us alive to understand all truth we need to know out of that scripture. So this is why we are a spirit-filled and spirit-led church. We believe that being spirit-filled has a practical application in our lives and a real impact on us and how we live and what we're called to do and able to do with a high view of scripture because it has been the tragedy of American or Western Pentecostalism in the last, give or take, 100 years that by a wide margin, the vast majority of all heretical views that have entered into the Christian world in in new or reinvented ways in the last hundred years um, have come through our movement. And I believe that that is because somehow we got this idea that me and the Holy Ghost, we've got our own thing and it's out here 
over on the side. And yeah, the Bible is for babes. That, And I'm being a little bit silly when I say that, but there's really some attitudes that are very close to this, uh, if not exactly this. Well, yeah, the Bible's for, for babes when, when you don't really have your own connect with God. But I've got the Holy Ghost and man, God just tells me what I need to know in the moment. And let me tell you something, God may speak to you in the moment like that, but if you are not governed by scripture and you don't have a high view of scripture, holding it above any personal inspiration you might feel like you're getting, then God may speak to you, but so will everybody else in the spirit world and you won't know the difference. And this is why we must have our identity of being spirit-filled and spirit-led firmly tethered to a high view of scripture. Promised Land believes that the canon is closed. We hold that along with all of Orthodox Christianity going all the way back to the first century at, or maybe the, the middle of the second century, right around there, that these books that are in our canon these have been universally recognized by the Lord's church as scripture. Uh, they've been debated when they needed to be debated, prayed on, and, and all of the leaders from the different groups of Christians got together, and these were the books that made the grade. And so at Promised Land, it's very core to our identity the, the, the canon is closed. This is scripture. God's word has been given to us in the 66 books we carry in our Bible. And the only further revelation that comes from the spirit or illumination is understanding what our eyes don't see in scripture in the natural. It makes the connections come alive. This is why we are spirit-filled, we are spirit-led, and we have a high view of Scripture because it is crucial to us that we remain firmly grounded and tethered to the Word of God as we have received it in Scripture. Because the vision God has given us is big. We see Promised Land as a church chosen by God to raise up an army of Holy Spirit-empowered witnesses of Jesus Christ in preparation for His coming kingdom. And we believe that each believer must be matured into their own ministry and deployed to carry the gospel to every place on earth, beginning at Austin. That's a very, it's a very large statement. We talk about it in terms of raising up an army of one million people and sending them out to do the Lord's work, whether here or abroad or wherever, church planters, missionaries, disciple makers of all stripes, people that will go into the, the, the workforce and the business realm and will show forth what the church looks like when it's operating in conjunction with education and the marketplace and, and do the Lord's work at the highest level. And in order to do that, they're going to have to have a groundedness in Scripture that will not allow them to deviate into error or we're gonna do more damage than we do help. So I wanna just close with what this looked like in the life of Jesus. Last week I asked you to read Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and I just wanna read you a couple verses from each. Matthew 4 says, Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Did you hear that? He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Imagine that, the Holy Ghost leading you into trouble, but it won't leave you in trouble. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and the tempter came to him, said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones that these stones become bread. And Jesus, who was the very Word of God incarnate, he was the Word of God in human form, answered out of scripture. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the enemy hits him with another temptation and Jesus comes back. It is written again and gives him another verse of the Torah. And only after those two temptations, then the third temptation comes. And, and Jesus finally tells them, I've had enough with you, get out of here. And how does he chase them away? With scripture, for it is written, 
It is written, it is written, Jesus' weapon, as he was full of the Holy Ghost and led by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness to face temptation with the devil. Then the devil came to tempt him, and Jesus' response was the written word. Even Jesus, who was the word of God in flesh, responded with the written word made alive by the Holy Ghost. Verse 11, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The Lord will send spirits to minister to us from the throne of God when we need strength, and that happens to believers all through uh, history. And then Matthew just right away says, now when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, but I want you to finish this evening with Luke's account. Luke doesn't just say Jesus was led by the Spirit. He makes sure to tell us he was filled with the Spirit. Luke 4 and 1, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Jesus was Spirit-filled and Spirit-led into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. Afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. The enemy comes to tempt him, the same exact account, the same temptations, the same it is written defense, the the sword of the word made alive by the Holy Ghost. Verse 13, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The enemy never leaves for good. He's going to leave for good when he's cast in the pit, but until then he's going to just go away and come back at a better time. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news went out through all the surrounding region about him. So Jesus, who was Spirit-filled, was Spirit-led, and that caused him to use the written Word of God as his primary defense against the kingdom of darkness. Promised Land is a Spirit-filled and Spirit-led church with a high view of Scripture. It's time for you to jump into your class, but I wanted to leave you with this to be chewing on. We're going to continue by God's grace into our vision and values and all those statements further deeper into all this. So please come back and stick with us over the next two weeks following tonight. And let's finish out this month strong on vision. I remember jumping a class. Lord, do your work in us. Fill us with your spirit. Lead us by your spirit and help us to have a high view of scripture and make it come alive to us so we can do your work. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. See you Sunday in Jesus' name.